Page 15. A dull pain seized her stomach. She pulled blades of grass from their sheets and ate the sweet ends. They were not very satisfying, so she picked a handful of caribou moss, a lichen. If the deer could survive in winter on this food, why not she? She munched, decided the plant might taste better if cooked, and went to the pond for water. As she dipped her pot in, she thought about Amarok. Why had he bared his teeth at her? Because she was young and knew she couldn't hurt him? No, she said to herself. It was because he was speaking to her. He had told her to lie down. She had even understood and obeyed him. He had talked to her not with his voice, but with his ears, eyes, and lips. And he, he had even commanded her with a wag of his tail. She dropped her pot, scrambled up to the frost heave, and stretched out on her stomach. Amarag, she called softly. I understand what you said. Can you understand me? I'm hungry, very, very hungry. Please bring me some meat. The great wolf did not look her way, and she began to doubt her reasoning. After all, flattened ears and a tag whale were scarcely a conversation. She dropped her forehead against the lichens and rethought what she had what had gone between them. Then why did I lie down? she asked, lifting her head and looking at Amarok. Why did I? She called to the yawning wolves. Not one turned her way. Amarok got to his feet, and he slowly arose. He seemed to fill the sky and blot out the sun. He was enormous. He could swallow her without even chewing. But he won't, she reminded herself. Wolves don't eat people. That's gussic talk. Capigan said wolves are gentle brothers. The black puppy was looking at her and wagging his tail. Hopefully, Mayak held out a pleading hand to him. His tail wagged harder. The mother rushed to him and stood above him sternly. When he licked her cheek apologetically, she pulled back her lips from her, from her fine white teeth. They flashed as she smiled and forgave her cub. But don't let that happen again, said Mayak sarcastically, mimicking her own elders. The mother walked toward Armorak. I should call you Martha after my stepmother, Mayak whispered. But you're, so mu you're much too beautiful. I shall call you Silver instead. Silver moved in a halo of light, for the sun sparkled on the ground hairs that grew out over the dense underfur that she seemed to glow. The reprimanded pup snapped at a crane fly and shook himself. Bits of lichen and grass spun across his fur. He reeled unsteadily, took a wider stance, and looked down at his sleeping sister. With a yak, he jumped on her and rolled her to her feet. She whined. He barked and picked up a bone. When he was sure she was watching, he ran down the slope with it. The sister tagged after him. He stopped, and she grabbed the bone too. She pulled, he pulled, and then he pulled and she yanked. Maya could not help laughing. The puppies played with bones like Eskimo children played with leather ropes. I understand that, she said to the pups. That's tug of war. Now how do you say I'm hungry? Amarok was pacing restlessly along the crest of the frost heap as if something were about to happen. His eyes shot to silver, then to the gray wolf Mayak had named Nails. These glances seemed to be summons, for silver and Nails glided to him, spanked the ground with their forepaws, and bit him gently under the chin. He wagged his tail furiously and took Silver's slender nose in his mouth. She crouched before him, licked his neck, and lovingly bit his lower jaw. Amarok's tail flashed high as her mouthing charged him with vitality. He nosed her affectionately. Unlike the fox, who met his mate only in breeding season, Amarok lived with his mate all year. Next, Nails took Armrock's jaw in his mouth and the leader built the top of his nose. A third adult, a small male, came slinking out. He got down on his belly before Armorok, rolled trembling to his back, and wriggled. Hello, Jello, my ex whispered, for he reminded her of the quivering gussic dessert her mother-in-law made. She had seen the wolf's mouth Armorok's chin twice before, and so she concluded that it was a ceremony, a sort of hail to the chief. He must indeed be their leader, for he was clearly the wealthy wolf, that is, wealthy as she had known the meaning of the word on Nunavik Island. There, the old Eskimo hunter she had known in her childhood thought the riches of life were intelligence, fearlessness, and love. A man with these gifts was rich and a great spirit, who was admired in the same way that the Gussics admire a man with money and goods. The three adults paid tribute to Armorak until he was almost smothered with love. Then he bade a wild note that sounded like the wind on a frozen sea. 
With that, the others sat around him, the puppies scattered between them. Jello hunched forward, and Silver shot a fierce glance at him. Imitated, Jello pulled his ears together and back. He drew himself down until he looked smaller than ever. Armorak wailed again, stretching his neck until his head was high above the others. They gazed at him affectionately, and it was plain to see that he was their great spirit, a royal leader who held his group together with love and wisdom. Any fear Mayak had of the wolves was dispelled by their affection for each other. They were friendly animals and so devoted to Armorak that she needed only to be accepted by him to be accepted by all. She even knew how to achieve this, bite him under the chin. But how is she going to do that? She studied the pups, hoping they had had a simpler way of expressing their love for him. The black puppy approached the leader, sat, then lay down and wagged his tail vigorously. He gazed up at Armorak in pure adoration, and the royal eyes softened. Well, that's what I'm doing, Mayak thought. She called to Armorak. I'm lying down, gazing at you too, but you won't look at me that way. When all the puppies were wagging his praises, Armorak yipped, hit a high note, and crooned. As his voice rose and fell, the other adults sang out and the puppies yipped and bounced. The song ended abruptly. Armorak arose and trotted swiftly down the slope. Nails followed, and behind him ran Silver, then Jello. But Jello did not run far. Silver turned and looked him straight in the eye. She pressed her ears forward aggressively and lifted her tail. With that, Jello went back to the puppies, and the three sped away like dark birds. Maya hunched toward on her elbows. Uh, the better to see and learn. She now knew how to be a good puppy, pay tribute to the leader, and even to be a leader by biting others on the top of the nose. She also knew how to tell Jello to babysit. If only she had big ears and a tail, she could lecture and talk to them all. Flapping her ears on her head for ears, she flattened her fingers to make friends, pulled them together and back to express fear, and shot them forward to display her aggression and dominance. Then she folded out her arms and studied the puppies again. The black one greeted Jello by tackling his feet. Another jumped on his tail, and before he could discipline either, all five were upon him. He rolled and tumbled with them for almost an hour. Then he ran down the slope, turned and stopped. The pursuing pups plowed into him, tumbled, fell, and lay still. During a minute of surprised recovery, there was no action. Then the black pup flashed his tail like a semaphore signal and all jumped on Jello again. My ex rolled over and laughed out loud. That's funny. They're really like kids. When she looked back, Jello's tongue was hanging from his mouth and his sides were heaving. Four of the puppies had collapsed at his feet and were. Jello flopped down too, but the black pup still looked around. He was not the least bit tired. My ex watched him, for there was something special about him. He ran to the top of the den and barked. The smallest pup, whom My ex called sister, lifted her head saw her favorite brother in action, and struggling to her feet, followed him devotedly. While they romped, Jello took the opportunity to rest behind a clump of siege, a moisture-loving plant of the tundra. But hardly was he settled before a pup trapped him to his hideout and poured on him. Jello narrowed his eyes, pressed his ears forward, and showed his teeth. I know what you're saying, she called to him. You're saying, lie down. The puppy lied down. The puppy lay down and my ex got on all fours and looked for the nearest pup to speak to. It was Sister. Um, she whined. And when Sister turned around, Julie narrowed her eyes and showed her white teeth. Obediently, Sister lay down. I'm talking wolf! I'm talking wolf! My ex clapped and tossing her head like a pup, crawled in a happy circle. As she was coming back, she saw all five puppies sitting in a row watching her, their heads cocked in curiosity. Boldly, the black pup came towards her, his fat backside swinging as he trotted to the bottom of her frost heave and barked. You are very fearless and very smart, she said. Now I know why you are so special. You are wealthy and the leader of the puppies. There is no doubt what you'll grow up to be. So I shall name you after my father, Capigan, and I shall call you Capu for short. Capu wrinkled his brow and turned an ear to tune in more accurately on her voice. You don't understand, do you? Hardly had she spoken than his tail went up, his mouth opened slightly, and he fairly grinned. Eli, she gasped, you do understand. And that scares me. She perched on her heels. Jello whined an undaunting note, and Capu turned back to the den. Mayax imitated the call to come home. 
Capo looked back over his shoulder in surprise. She giggled. He wagged his tail and jumped on Jello. She clapped her hands and settled down to watch the language of jumps and tumbles, elated that she was at least breaking the wolf code. After a long time, she decided they were not talking but roughhousing, and, she was, and so she started home. Later, she changed her mind. Roughhousing was very important to wolves. It occupied almost an entire night for the pups. Eli, okay, she said. I'll learn to roughhouse. Maybe then you'll accept me and feed me. She pranced, jumped, and whimpered. She growled, snarled, and rolled. But nobody came to roughhouse. Sliding back to her camp, she heard the grass swish and looked up to see Armorak and his hunters sweep around her frost heave and stop about five feet away. She could smell the sweet scent of their fur. The hairs on her neck rose and her eyes widened. Armorak's ears went forward aggressively, and she remembered that wide eyes meant fear to him. It was not good to show him she was afraid. Animals attacked the fearful. She tried to narrow them, but remembered that she, that was not right either. Narrowed eyes were mean. In desperation, she recalled that Kapu would move forward when challenged. She pranced right up to Armorak. Her heart beat furiously as she grunt whined the sound of a puppy begging adoringly for attention. Then she got down on her belly and gazed at him with fondness. The great wolf backed up and avoided her eyes. She had said something wrong, perhaps even offended him. Some slight gesture that meant nothing to her had apparently meant something to the wolf. His ear shot forward angrily and it seemed all was lost. She wanted to get up and run, but she gathered her courage and pranced closer to him. Swiftly, she patted him under the chin. The signal went off. It sped through his body and triggled emotions of love. Armrak's ears flattened and his tail wagged in friendship. He could not react in any other way to the chin pat, for the roots of this signal lead deep in wolf history. It was inherited from generations and generations of leader before him. As his eyes softened, the sweet odor of ambrosia arose from the gland on the top of his tail, and she was drenched lightly in wolf scent. Myax was one of the pack.